Hi Church, welcome to Church Today. As you know, we've been advertising that there's going to be no service on Sunday because Christmas is so close and we usually give people time off to rest and to recuperate. We give our volunteers off because Christmas time we usually have so many services across all the campuses. But we realized today, you know what, everyone's at home. We're pretty much in that serious lockdown stage again. And most people will be wanting to watch a message or enjoy time in the Word and enjoy a time of worship. So we're going to present you today with a message that was preached last year, Christmas, and we can reminisce a bit because that was the last time really we were together as a whole church in our building, packed out, celebrating Christmas. So I hope you enjoy the message. We can have a time of worship now and uh, trust that you'll enter in. Uh, let's really enjoy today, even though it's one of those lull days in the holidays, and let's enjoy God's presence and God's word. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, let's celebrate him, church. Here's to the one who made the morning bright. Here's to the one who taught the stars to shine. Here's to the one who graced the dead of night. Pull me from the dark, save my heart.
the spirit breathing holy fire within my ever present hand speaking truth when I can't find it light up this broken
Well, I hope you enjoyed the worship today and that you really entered in. And uh, we've got the message from last year, a moment in time. Isn't it amazing that this is a moment in time? Who would have thought that we'd be in lockdown? But I hope you enjoy the Christmas message. I don't know, uh, Pastor Bilmer might want to uh, comment on it. It was a good message last year. We felt it spoke directly into the life of church, that moment in time that God planned when Jesus would come. And uh, I hope you enjoy it today. Amen. Yeah, you know, the a moment in time is every moment in time that matters and that counts. And I'm just so grateful that we can do this. We can still do church online and we can capture, even if it's from last year's message, it can be fresh to us again because it's the truth of God's word. And uh, we remember that moment in time that God sent his only son and we celebrate his beauty and his kindness and his love to us. Well, before we go into that moment in time and go back into that packed auditorium, I just want to mention that, again, you have an opportunity to remain faithful in your giving. And thank you to everyone who has been faithful in their giving. Amen. We want to keep encouraging you to be faithful from your, with your tithes and your offerings, from your bonuses and various means that you would have got over December. For those of you that are struggling, continue to honor God and trust him to honor you. We've been able to keep all our staff. We've been able to maintain our facilities because while yeah. they're not being used, they still need to be maintained. Yeah. And we're grateful to you for that. So continue. While we're not meeting publicly, everything continues as it usually does. Amen. And when we get back, everything will be ready. So yeah. you'll see the various campuses on screen because we're across all the campuses today. And you can give according to your campus as you watch today. Be faithful in your giving. Pastor Wilma, would you pray for everyone who's giving today? Amen. Let's pray around our giving. And I'm also going to pray for the needs of every person who is watching. Father God, thank you so much for the kindness and the faithfulness of your people. Mm -hmm. People who belong to you, who understand the need of running church. And Father God, thank you that this year, uh, during 2020, uh, your people remained faithful and obedient and I know that you're going to bless them that Lord um, as they believe you according to your promises Father God that you will supply all their needs according to your riches in glory and we receive this offering today and we know it's going to be a fragrant offering and it's going to um, um, help us Lord God to just continue to build your house and um, to supply the needs of those who are poor and for our staff. And Father, we also just want to remember those who have had a really tough year this year with COVID, Lord, that they've either had the disease or they have it right now. And we just pray for your mercy, yes. your kindness. Won't you wrap your arms around them, your loving arms, yes, Father? Won't you bring family. healing to family members? Thank and you, Lord. Father, won't you bring comfort mm. of your Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And at this time, as people are perhaps mourning, it's meant to be a happy time. There are those who are perhaps not happy at all because they've suffered a tremendous loss. Why don't you just meet them where they're at, Lord God? For those with financial problems, Lord, we also pray that you will open doors and you'll shut the, shut the wrong doors in their lives, Father God, and that you will supply needs and for relationships and whatever the needs are there, Lord, you know what they are and you hear the cries of your people and you're ready to assist us in whatever way that you have promised that you will. And so we just want to thank you for your giving and for meeting the needs of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's trust God. He is almighty and able to meet every need, no matter what you're facing. And we're trusting with you and we're praying for you as a church across our campuses, believing for God's best. Amen. I was reading about the Queen of England. And uh, when the Queen of England travels anywhere, she doesn't do it spontaneously. Kings and queens normally plan things. There's special arrangements that have to be made, preparations that have to be done months, sometimes even years in advance. They don't do things randomly. They very carefully prepare. If you've watched The Crown on television, it's a series about the queen and the royal family. There was an episode recently that recorded the events of 1966. In the country of Wales, there is a little village called Aberfan a mining village, and they would mine the dirt and place it on a mountainside 
but they didn't know that underneath there was a spring. And so the spring wet all the mud, the rains came down, and the mud turned into slurry, and it slid down the hill. It engulfed the entire village. In fact, it engulfed a school, and some 116 children were killed in one go. Half the village's children, and 28 adults. And it became the, one of the biggest disasters in the United Kingdom. And uh, the queen's husband decided to go and visit out of his own, but the queen didn't go. But then when he had been and he'd seen what had happened, eight days later, she decided, I better go. And she went, but this is what the people of Aberfan said. It's a little bit too late. Why didn't you come earlier? And queens make mistakes with timing. In fact, when Princess Diana died, it took five days before the queen made a statement. And everyone said, why isn't the queen speaking up? It's a bit late. How many of you know kings and queens of this world can make mistakes with timing, but God's never early and God's never late. God is the eternal in time. He was and he is and he is to come. And God's timing is absolutely perfect. When Jesus was born was a perfect timing with lots of preparation and planning. And when Jesus died, perfect timing with lots of planning and preparation. In fact, let's read first what it says about Jesus' death because ultimately he was born to die. It says in Romans chapter five and verse six, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly at just the right time. By the way, the ungodly are all of us in the world, in this building. We need Jesus. But then it says of his birth, notice the word in Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the right time came, the time God decided on, he sent his son. He didn't just arrive, he was sent on a mission. And it says born of a woman. Pretty obvious, eh? Couldn't be born of a man. But why does it say that? We'll look at it a bit later. It says here further, born as a Jew to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own sons. God didn't send Jesus so he could wag his finger at you and you could behave better. He came to receive you, forgive you, and make you part of his family and have a relationship with you so that you could grow as a person in God's house. Other translations, the ESV says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Notice, born of a woman. You think, well, why does it say that? We'll look a bit later. In the CV, it says, when the time was right, God sent his son, and a woman gave birth. And again, in the Revised Standard Version, but when the time had fully come, there was that right moment in time that the Bible's communicating here, an exact timing of God, the exact planning of God, Jesus didn't just arrive like another religious teacher who woke up one day and said, I think I've got the gift of motivational speaking. Jesus stands out in history and he arrived at that moment in time. I want to speak about that moment in time today. And I want us to look about at the importance of that moment in time. And then I want us at the end of the meeting, so be prepared for it, to come to our moment in time. Because that moment in time came so that we might find our moment in time. It's so important as we think of time and the moments in time. There's some very important moments in time that all of us remember. The World Cup and Nelson Mandela's release from prison. Nelson Mandela's inauguration. But you know, one of the moments I remember when I was growing up was when John F. Kennedy was shot. I was in Standard 2, nine years old. And I remember the radio broadcast being interrupted. And it stuck with me. I can even remember the atmosphere of that moment in time. And you know, when Jesus was born, there was an atmosphere. There was something special about it. And God's perfect timing came together. And God sent his son. When Jesus came to the earth, he lived according to a timetable. He didn't just randomly visit and speak and hang out with people. There was a divine timetable. Notice two verses here, John chapter 7. Jesus speaking. He says, I am not yet going up to this feast because for me the right time has not yet come. And then in John chapter 13 at the Last Supper, it says, as soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, my time has come. He knew exactly that moment in time 
that the Father had ordained for him to come, for him to live, and then for him to die. I want to look at seven things today, or seven reasons why the birth of Jesus happened at that unique, special moment in time. Are you ready? Number one, the first one is this. Biblical prophecies at the time when Jesus was born had created high expectations. There had been so many biblical prophecies over thousands of years, 351 Old Testament references to the Messiah, the Savior who had come, 64 that Jesus fulfilled in exact detail, and people were waiting with expectation, when's he coming? Because this is what they thought, he would be a political figure that would free them from poverty and from loneliness and from the oppression of Rome, but he didn't come as a political figure. And every day, every year, every election, we see people putting their hope in physical people and then becoming angry and disappointed. Because you can be free politically, but you can still be bound spiritually. And so there was this expectation and God knew that the timing was perfect. Jesus would fulfill all these prophecies. In fact, the prophecies were there right from the very beginning. When Eve sinned, the Lord said to her, you're going to have a child from the woman is going to come a seed, a offspring, who's going to crush the devil's head. So everyone knew that a person would come, a man would come, and he'd be born and he'd be a deliverer. Then Isaiah the prophet comes, and he speaks of this unique one. This is some 700 years before Jesus comes. And and let me read it to you. He speaks about this unique son. He says in Isaiah 9, For to us a child is born, to us a son is born is given. Can you see the difference? The one is the natural, the other is the spiritual. Uh, A child is born, that, that, that happens all the time. But a son is given. There's intentionality there. And then he says, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be a deliverer. That's what they were expecting. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. He'll give you advice if you need it. Mighty God, when you, when you lack strength, he's all you need. Everlasting Father, he'll nurture you and never let you down and never abandon you like an earthly father. The Prince of Peace and of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. This amazing one was spoken about and people were waiting. They were saying, when's he coming? When's he coming? And God said, the time's right. Let's send him now. And Jesus was born at the perfect time when expectations are high. Do you know I've discovered that at Christmas every year in congregations like this, expectations are also high. People are also looking for someone, something. Number two, the second thing is this. Why was it that moment in time? Well, the availability of willing people. God found in Mary and Joseph a willing couple who wouldn't turn the immaculate conception into a media circus and put it on Instagram. Can you imagine if Mary and Joseph were alive today? Guess what? Last night, saw an oak covered in white, glowing. He touched me and I'm pregnant. Yeah, yeah, ha ha, smiley face, hand clap. You gotta be kidding. Laugh out loud. Come on. And it's, it's interesting, Mary and Joseph, You see, carrying the Christ is not a female business, it's a family affair. Men often send their wives or drop their wives off or come with their wives reluctantly. No, at Rivers Church, we are men and women serving God together, steering the family. And God finds in this couple, they say she was about 13, he was about 16. He finds a maturity and a holiness and a purity in them and they're willing and receptive and he lets the Christ child be born. I don't think the couples like that come dime a dozen. I think God found in them a uniqueness. And when you read the genealogy in Matthew's gospel, we read about where this whole thing progressed from. This is not some random couple. God had seen throughout the ages. You know, God sees before time. And he saw that this would happen. And the genealogy in, in, in Matthew, when you start reading, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and you think, why does it start with this? Most stories start with once upon a time. But this one starts with that moment in time. Completely different. And it's not embellished, and all sorts of things are added to pad the story. It's telling you that this is something very significant that actually took place. And, and here's the thing. Why was Jesus born of a woman? 
Because sin started in the garden with a woman. So how many of you know if sin started in the garden with a woman, sin would be ended through a woman giving birth to a savior? It says in Matthew's gospel, chapter one and verse one, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It goes right back to the beginning. Then we skip over for time to verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Suddenly the woman's introduced. We're talking about Joseph's line, but now the, the woman is introduced. And Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. But watch this. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile to Babylon. And 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Can you see the perfect timing of God? 14 is two sevens. Seven is the perfect number of God. Here's this 42 generations before that moment in time when people were expectant, prophecies had been understood, and here's this willing couple. Pretty amazing, eh? Pretty amazing. And, uh, and I love Jesus' genealogy because there's all sorts of people in it. Females, prostitutes. So it's not just a man's religion. It's not just a woman's religion. There are prostitutes. There's a woman who slept with her father-in-law. There's David who killed his best friend, Uriah, took his wife. It shows you that Jesus is not ashamed to have sinners associated with him because that's why he came. And now this moment in time when Mary came. You see now, why did God cause a child to be born through a woman? Well, here's the thing. A woman, a virgin, in the Garden of Eden tempted Adam to sin. Now a virgin, a woman, carries the Christ child who frees us from sin. Do you know they viewed throughout history Mary as a type of Eve? All the early church fathers speak of Mary as the righteous Eve. Eve tempted Adam to sin, but Mary was not tempted to sin. She bore the Christ child to free us from sin. Notice what the early church fathers say about Mary. Saint Ephraim, he was a Syrian deacon. And he said, Eve wrote a bill of debt and the virgin paid the debt. Saint Augustine in 430 says this, a woman handed the poison to the man who was to be deceived. A woman hands salvation to the man to be restored. It is a great sacrament as death came to us by a woman, life was born to us by a woman, so that in both sexes, feminine and masculine, the devil being conquered might be tormented as he had glorified in the downfall of both. Both sexes, that is. John Christotum in 407, a early church father, he says, a virgin expelled us from paradise. Through a virgin, we found eternal life. Through a virgin, we were conquered, and through a virgin, we were crowned. That's why in the Bible, people misunderstand, Jesus said to his mother at his first miracle, woman, what have I to do with you? He didn't speak to her with disrespect. He was referring to woman as in Eve, because Eve handed to Adam the first temptation of that fruit, but Mary instructed Jesus to perform his first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And that's when he said to a woman, which was referring back to Eve, because while Eve tempted Adam to sin, the second Adam, Jesus, now by his mother, the second Eve, was being tempted to do the first miracle. Pretty amazing. The timing of God, the parallels, the pictures, and this timing was right. Here were these, this willing couple, and Jesus does his first miracle. And his mother and father, don't turn it into a media circus. Number three, are you with me this morning? It was time for the second exodus. Well, we all know there was a first exodus, and the first exodus took a long time. Moses was being prepared in the wilderness, and God then sent him after 300 years of Israel being in captivity, and Moses led them out. Now, Jesus was coming like a second Moses to lead the people out of sin. Not out of a place, not out from under political leadership, but he was leading them into a place. We've got to be careful we don't put politics before our spiritual lives. First, we put the Son of God and the King of Kings first, then we put politics in their rightful place. Then you'll never be disillusioned, disappointed, angry, and want to keep protesting. Because you'll never have perfect politics anywhere in the world. Hmm? Every time they elect a leader in Britain, they celebrate them like the savior. And then within three months, they're the villain. 
Read the Daily Mail. I mean, you, you don't have to be as old as me to know that. I've seen this happen for, for decades. You can be 20-something and you can see this picture. See, because we rely on something that God didn't intend us to rely on. Jesus didn't come to lead you out of South Africa, out of a political party. He came to lead you out of sin, bondage, and a mindset into a place in him where you're free. And here it comes along. Now listen, if there was a first exodus, what happened at the first exodus? They built a tabernacle, didn't they? And they had the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because when you're leaving somewhere, you've got to take God's presence with you. Well, Jesus comes along, and guess what? Mary becomes the tabernacle because God visited her and lived in her. You all remember the tabernacle was a tent in the wilderness? God lived in it. It was his habitation. Hmm? Now, when Jesus was about to be born, Mary became the tabernacle. God came to live in her. Notice what it says here in John chapter 1 and verse 14 about Jesus coming. It says, so the word Jesus became human and made his home among us. Young's literal translation, and the word became flesh and did tabernacle among us. Isn't that interesting? The tree of life version says, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So here's Mary, she's carrying Jesus and Jesus now becomes the habitation of God. But the ark, the ark was this wooden box made of acacia wood, which is incorruptible, covered with gold. Inside is the rod of Aaron that budded, showing that Aaron was the true priest of God. There's also the Ten Commandments in there, the perfection of the law that Jesus fulfilled, and then the manna that came down from heaven. How many of you know Jesus was the priest after Melchizedek? He embodied the full law and fulfilled the law, and he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. So Mary becomes the habitation. Her womb becomes like the ark where Jesus lives, and now they're about to leave in the second exodus. What an amazing thing. The people understood that. And they said, we're ready to go. Free us from Rome. And he said, no, no, that's not how it's going to work. I'm going to free you from your sin. And that's going to make you truly free, even if you're in Rome. And so here's this amazing thing, how she became the holy place. The, the Bible says that the, the, in, in the original Greek language of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, there, when the tabernacle had the presence of God come over it, uh, it's the same word that's used of Mary, where she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. The exact same word is used. She became the tabernacle. She became the ark carrying Jesus. And it was a pretty amazing thing. People were ready to leave and make a fresh start. Number four, Greek culture had changed the world. You see, the timing when Jesus came was perfect because Greek, the Greek language was the international business language of the world at that time. The reason was is that the great Alexander, Alexander the Great, he had conquered and ruled over the world. For 12 years, he was uh, in charge of spreading Greek culture and language throughout the known world. Aristotle was his teacher. So he was an intellectual, he was a brilliant general, he was a brilliant man, and the Greek language was spread throughout the world. Everyone understood Greek. So when Jesus came, everyone understood the Greek language. It was easy to spread the gospel in Greek. And not only that, one of the Egyptian kings, Ptolemy II, he had proclaimed that the Old Testament in Hebrew be translated into Greek. So by the time of Alexander, this translation of the Old Testament, when Jesus appeared, everyone could understand and it could be spread around the whole world that God's son had arrived. Talk about timing. Pretty amazing. There was no better time for Jesus to come. And then after Jesus uh, started his ministry and then he died and rose from the dead, the disciples went to all the synagogues where Greek was spoken and they spread the gospel throughout the known world. Number five, are you still with me? The Pax Romana was in existence. What's the Pax Romana? Well, the Pax Romana was a hundred years of peace and stability that took place at the time when Jesus was born. Up to that time, there'd been many, many wars, but now the Pax Romana was known as the Peace of Rome. It was a peaceful, stable time where Rome ruled over most of the world and Rome established infrastructure like roads 
and buildings and, and, and education. And so as a result of that, the gospel could spread in the Greek language through this infrastructure. If Jesus had come 100 years earlier, the Israeli nation wouldn't have been in its present position and, and they would have still been at war. And if he had come later, in AD 70, the Romans killed off the Jews and invaded the temple. So there was this perfect window, that moment in time. And God said, okay, now's the time. Let's send him. Can you see how all these things work together? It's not like Jesus just appeared. I'm going to be a teacher. Oh, great. We agree. You're very clever. You're amazing. Yeah, we think you're wise. You're just like Buddha. You're just like Muhammad. Okay, there's, you're just one of many. Okay. No, no. This is God's son visiting the planet. And the timing is absolutely perfect. These political, geographical, linguistic, religious and philosophical trends all prepared the time for Jesus to come. But there are two more. Number six, are you with me? Jesus fulfilled the Jewish feasts. When Jesus came, because he was a Jew and he would be the Messiah, he would have to fit in with all the Jewish feasts. So his birthday would have to take place at what's called tabernacles. Tabernacles was when they came out of Egypt and they were living in the wilderness and the tabernacle was with them and they were living in God's presence. Jesus was born at tabernacles. Why don't you look at this diagram on the screen? There's seven feasts of Israel and Jesus was born, we believe, in September. Some of you are disappointed. Just hold on a moment. It's not December the 25th. You say, well, why do we celebrate it? There's certain things that have always been like that. There's no point trying to buck them. They can be not rejected, not just received. Oh, we celebrate Christmas on the 25th, but we redeem it. It was once a pagan festival where they worshiped the sun on the 25th of December. But how do you clearly know that today we're making no reference to that? We're celebrating Jesus. But Jesus was born in September at Tabernacles because God made his dwelling with us. And then he died at Passover, which you can see. Passover was when they sacrificed the lamb to leave Egypt and Jesus died for our sins. So Jesus fulfilled all seven of those feasts in his life. The timing of God of his birth was absolutely perfect. But there's one last one. This is the one that is in existence today. Why was it the perfect moment for Jesus to come? Because there was a deep longing for freedom. The people were longing for freedom. You see, the Romans had millions of slaves and Israel was a slave nation. And they knew when Messiah comes, he's gonna free us. But they thought it would be political. But it wasn't, it was spiritual. Because the spiritual always comes before the natural. And Jesus arrives and in Luke's gospel, he gets up and he opens the book of Isaiah and he says, I've come to set the captives free. He wasn't speaking about being released from Rome. He was speaking about captive to sin, captive to ideas, captive to depression, captive to emptiness. He said, I've come to preach good news to the poor. The poor said, oh good, we're gonna have socialism. No, I've come to teach you that although you're poor, you can be happy. And although you're poor, you can have a way out of poverty if you walk with me and you live according to my principles and you trust me and you can be happy despite being poor. You see, Jesus came to set people free and there was this longing. And because the timing was right, God was able to send Jesus. They received him. And uh, we today need to be careful that we don't keep looking to the wrong people, but we keep looking to heaven. Thank you, Lord, you sent your son. Now we look to him. You know, I was reading about the, uh, one of the mayors of a city in America, Atlantic City. In 2012, they were facing an imminent hurricane and uh, the mayor, Lorenzo Langford, he left it too late to actually warn the people to leave the city. And he told them to actually go down to the seafront and to hide in flimsy buildings. And 500 people nearly lost their lives. They finally managed to evacuate the people out of these flimsy buildings because guess what? Hurricane Sandy came in and it was the worst hurricane, did the most damage in American history, 1.1 trillion rand. You better be careful who you listen to about the safety of your life who you trust with flimsy ideas, flimsy political ideas, flimsy philosophical ideas, we need to first look to Jesus, then respect our politicians and respect our government, but the spiritual first, then the natural.
You see, all this happened to show that God chose that moment in time, you and me today, for our moment in time. Because his ultimate goal was that he would come at a certain time and then for centuries after that, people would respond and they would say, now it's my moment in time. Well, there we go. I hope you enjoyed that Christmas message. And as you can see, there's a moment in time that God chose to send his son into the world. I don't know if you know it, but there's also a moment in time when we need to respond. Jesus came, but it's not automatic that we know him or given him as our savior. We have to embrace him. And there has to be a moment in time that you know, I receive Jesus as my Lord and savior. Most Christians, if you speak to them, will be able to tell you on that day, at that time, I received Christ as Lord. And so if you'd like to do that today, to avail yourself of the gift of God's Son, who was sent at that moment in time for your salvation, why don't you pray with me right now? If you've never done this before, pray this prayer with me that's on the screen. Father, I come to you today and I thank you that at this moment in time, I can ask Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, to come into my life and to save me. Today, I make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life and I ask him to be my savior and to give me the gift of eternal life. And I thank you, God, for sending your son. I receive him now. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Simple prayer, profound result. And you know what? I'd love you to click on the QR code on the screen or go onto our website, click the salvation button, and you can avail yourself of all the information you need to walk and make a journey of faith. The information there is not to get money from you or to get a hold of you or to send you newsletters, but simply to take you on a track that helps you walk with God. So avail yourself of it. It'll benefit you. And let us know the decision you've made. Well, it's Christmas time. I hope you have a good holiday, a good rest. And I hope you spend time with loved ones and with family. Keep your eyes on Jesus because he's the reason for the season. And we'll see you next time. Seems to hear words of the cheer from everywhere.